The main character of the tombs of Atuan is Arha, and we see at the very beginning of the novel that she is consecrated as a child to the service of the nameless ones. And these are going to turn out to be some of the old powers of the earth. And that's going to come through Ged, one of the other major characters of the novel, telling her some important things that allow a picture to be filled in further. And there's, there's actually a lot of information being given about the nameless ones. We begin by learning about a ritual that the young girl goes through that sets her apart. She is supposed to be the reincarnated priestess who has, you know, generation after generation after generation died, been reborn in another girl child at the exact same moment, brought to the temple, which is one of the oldest places in not just Atuan, but the Kargish Isles and civilization entirely. And it's because of these old powers that she is the servant, the, in some respects, the representative and the caretaker of. And there's a lot of rituals involved, which we don't have to go into. You can read them in the book. But these nameless ones exist. We don't really know how long did they ever have a beginning? Did they emerge with the earth itself in Earthsea? Um, their, their antiquity goes back too far for human beings or perhaps even dragons to know. But they live, in this case, at and under the tombs of Ottawa. So they're, they're localized. They don't have a lot of sway over what's going to happen on other islands or even quite so much in other parts of Atuan. Yet early on in the Kargish civilization, this became a place where the nameless ones were consulted uh, through a form of divination and the priestess was an incredibly important mediator. And the priestess herself, in this case, Arha, is the current Arha, the current Eaton one. Her name, as she gets at the start and then gets back later on, is Tenar, but her name is Eaton for a good half of the novel. And we also find out that prisoners who have done, you know, terrible things. In, in the case of the three men who are sent, they tried to attack the god king. They're sent to Atuan for punishment by the priestess. And she, Arha, now as a, a uh, young woman, takes some uh, agency in this. And they're also viewed as being eaten by the nameless ones because they die in those tombs, which would also apply to the many different heroes and thieves and mages that came trying to seek the lost half of the ring of uh, Aerith Akba, right? Who are also trapped <laughs> underneath the, the tombs in the maze. And so eating is kind of a metaphor here for what these ancient powers do. They are older and have precedence over the other cults of, of the Kargs, uh, including the twin brothers, but also especially the god kings who are kind of a Johnny come lately, a new, new kid on the block, religiously speaking. And there's actually a, an important confrontation that is going to take place between the priestess, the high priestess of the god king, and the um, arha, the, the priestess of the um, nameless ones. And th there's this confrontation that takes place having to do with the wizard uh, who, who's there. And uh, arha says... Um, uh, my, my masters will tell me, uh, the rest does not concern you, priestess. This time she'd gone too far. Others could hear. 
Castle was aware of it. All that happens here is my concern, mistress. All that happens in his realm is the concern of the God King, the man immortal whose servant I am. Even into the places underground and into the hearts of men does he search and look and none shall forbid him entrance. Then Arha says, I shall. Into the tombs no one comes if the nameless ones forbid it. They were before your God King and will be after him. Speak softly of them, priestess. Do not call their vengeance on you. They will come into their, your dreams. They will enter the dark places in your mind and you will go mad. The girl's eyes were blazing. Castle's face was hidden, drawn into the black cowl. They are old, Castle's voice said, not loud, a whistling thread of sound out of the depths of the cowl. They are old. Their worship is forgotten, save in this one place. Their power is gone. They are only shadows. They have no power anymore. Do not try to frighten me, Eaton One. You are the first priestess. That Does that not mean also that you are the last? You cannot trick me. I see into your heart the darkness hides nothing from me. And then Arha says, may the dark ones eat your soul castle she casts a curse on her and so what we've got here is a conflict between two different religious cults and perhaps two powers there's the god kings who are the new you know representative uniting uh, the kargish lands into an empire a uh, very visible power and then we have the chthonian uh, gods or powers of the earth who we don't see and we're not quite sure if they have power or not. What we do have going on before that is that the nameless ones have their domain at the tombs and underneath the tombs. What we see mentioned over and over again is not just darkness but their vengeance, their anger, their wrath at sacrilege or defiling that could happen. Their, their, their area is supposed to be only for the priestess. What we find is that even the other high priestesses say, eh, we're not going to go into all of these parts. Although Kassel herself, as, as we've seen, is a disbeliever and is willing to commit sacrilege. She lights up the room that is never supposed to be illuminated so that she can check whether Ged's grave, not really his grave, is a true one containing his body or not. And Ged himself will suggest that the old powers have driven Castle mad, a madness where she cannot even recognize that they are dangerous, that transgression will bring about their anger. And we learn a lot about these powers. Actually, so does Arha. She learns about the very power she's dealing with by her engagements with Get. And this is, uh, this is quite important, um, what's, what's happening here. First, she, think, you know, she sees him and she says, this guy is here to commit sacrilege. The word came slowly into Arha's mind. This was a man. No man's foot must ever touch the soil of the tombs, the holy place. Yet he had come here into the hollow place that was the heart of the tombs. He had made light where light was forbidden, where it had never been since the, world be the world's beginning. Why did the nameless ones not strike him down? Her masters had eaten those three. Why did they not eat this one? What were they waiting for? For their hands to act? For their tongue to speak? And as it's going to turn out, her masters, the nameless ones, the old powers of the earth, the only thing that's holding them back is, is Ged's own magic. A little bit later on, she's asking him about the scars on his face and uh, she says did, did a dragon do that no not a dragon he says the scars were before i was a dragon lord i told you i had met with the dark powers before in other places of the earth this on my face is the mark of one of the kinship of the nameless ones but no longer nameless for i learned his name in the end she says, what do you mean? What name? I cannot tell you that. And what we're talking about there is the shadow 
from a wizard of Earthsea that had you know, scarred up his, Ged's face and that he named with his own name at the very end of the novel, bringing about a resolution and a sort of reintegration. But he also encountered one of the other old powers of the Earth, not just a kinship with them, but one of the old powers in Oskil. So that's not being talked about here, but that's part of the story. We also find out that the reason why Ged has not succumbed to these powers, why they haven't done anything to him, is that he is actually, through his own force and power, checking them, holding them back. And um, Arha is actually quite upset when he tells her that. She says, um, nothing matters. The castle, the priestess of the God King, she was always cruel. She kept trying to make me kill you the way I killed those others. She defied the nameless ones and mocked them. I set a curse on her. Since then, I've been afraid of her because it's true what Manon said. She doesn't believe in the gods. She wants them to be forgotten and she'd kill me while I slept. Now I see her down there committing sacrilege, a light burning in the holy place, the dark, the dark place. The nameless ones did nothing. They didn't kill her or drive her mad. They are old, as she said. They're dead. They're all gone. I'm not a priestess anymore. And God says, oh, if it was so easy as that, I have been holding them back this entire time. He goes on and he says, um, Every instant since I set foot in the cavern under the tombstones, I have striven to keep them still, to keep them unaware. All my skills have gone to that. I have spent my strength on it. I have filled these tunnels with an endless net of spells, spells of sleep, of stillness, of concealment. Yet they're still aware of me, half aware, half sleeping, half awake. And even so, I am all but worn out striving against them. This is a most terrible place. One man alone has no hope here. Did you truly think them dead? You know better in your heart. They do not die. So they are very powerful indeed. And ironically, it's Ged's intervention that has made it possible for Castle to invade and to transgress without being punished. Ged also tells us some very important things, tells, tells Tenar or Arha this about the um, uh, powers. He says, they are dark and undying. They hate the light, the brief bright light of our mortality. They are immortal. Right? And he goes on and says, they, all their power is to darken and destroy. They cannot leave this place. They are this place, and it should be left to them. And he sketches out not only what they will do to other you know, beings, like human beings, he sketches out what human beings' attitude should be towards these old powers of the earth. He, just a little bit earlier, said, they are not gods, although they are immortal, they never were, and they are not worthy of the worship of any human soul. They've never given you anything, Tenar. And he, and he goes on and says, they should not be denied nor forgotten, neither should they be worshipped. The earth is beautiful and bright and kindly, but that's not all. The earth is also terrible and dark and cruel. The rabbit shrieks dying in the green meadows. The mountains clench their hands full of hidden fire. There are sharks in the sea and there is cruelty in men's eyes. So, you know, nature is both good and bounteous, but also sinister and terrifying and terrible. He goes on and he says, where men worship these things and abase themselves before them, their evil breeds. Their places are made in the world where darkness gathers, places given over wholly to the ones we call nameless, the ancient and holy powers of the earth before the light, the powers of the dark of ruin and madness. These nameless ones uh, are not dead. They, are, they exist, but they are not your masters. They never were. 
So he's, he's revealing to her that her priestess stature and status and the entire narrative is in a certain sense, not a lie, but a mistake, something that would be better not to be. And she's finding this out for herself. They escape from the tombs. And what we end up seeing is the anger of the ancient powers of the earth, the nameless ones uh, manifesting itself in a sort of self-destructive, but also oriented against the human being's action. So she, we, we see this, um, she turned and saw they were across the valley on a level now with the tombstones, the nine great monoliths that stood or lay above the cavern of diamonds and graves. The stones that stood were moving. Uh, one of them seemed to twitch and rise taller than a shutter went through it and it fell. Another fell smashing crossways on the, on the first and the earth of the valley ripples and buckles. There's an earthquake taking place. She looks to Gad and says, you held it back. You held back the earthquake, the anger of the dark. So the, the ancient powers, they manifest that power in something that's, uh, that's impotent to affect Arha or Tenar and Ged, but brings about the death of many of the other people in that area, including Kassel herself, who's meddling around in the throne room and underneath the, the earth. So what we get to see here is a, a very important part of the, let's call it the mythology and the magical powers of Earthsea. Things that are not human and according to Ged shouldn't be worshipped or perhaps even trafficked in by human beings. The ancient old powers of the earth.